I'll be open and transparent to start off with. Emma is my daughter. Uh, Tyler is my soon-to-be son-in-law, um, but they are both graduates uh, and, and ongoing students in the anthropology program here at Carleton. Uh, Tyler has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in anthropology from Carleton. He's currently a PhD student in anthropology here at Carleton as well. Uh, Emma is uh, a graduate of the Journalism and African Studies program. She has a master's degree in anthropology from Carleton and is currently a PhD student at Concordia University in Montreal, also studying anthropology. Uh, Emma and Tyler met in the anthropology program. And I have to say that they are getting married this summer. Uh, so you never know what's gonna happen when you come to, uh, um, to Carleton uh, to study, particularly in the anthropology department. So we're gonna start with Tyler. Can you tell us, uh, although you are a PhD student, you have worked through most of your degree and you are currently a full-time employee um, at Nokia and that's all I know. So you're gonna give us a little bit more information hopefully as to what is it you do there? What's your title? And, and how on earth did you get a job at Nokia given that you're an anthropology student? I'm a uh, user experience researcher at Nokia. So basically I work with the design teams and the product teams and the development teams to make sure we understand the people we're building products for. Uh, we mainly build network management software so that big telecoms companies can effectively manage all the hardware that they use to you know, carry data and uh, you know, run the internet essentially. Um, so my main job is basically helping the designers to understand who they're designing for, helping the product owners to design who needs what features and who finds it valuable and in what kind of combinations and how they should look and feel and things like that. Um, but my, my main job is really just to go out, talk to customers, get information, get data, um, show them concepts that we work on, get their feedback, um, walk through different kinds of tasks that they might use in the software and try to evaluate how well the software does what we'd like it to do, how well it conveys information that we'd like it to convey and uh, how well it kind of just generally fits the needs that we think they have. Um, before that, I had a similar role at RBC Ventures, which was a startup incubator owned and operated by the Royal Bank of Canada. And before that, I had uh, not too dissimilar role in research for public policy at Canadian Heritage, which is a government department. Okay. Um, and how did you end up at um, working at RBC and Nokia? Because again, I think maybe a traditional view of anthropology is um, <laughs> maybe less focused on um, working for a company like Nokia. Um, and uh, so it'd be interesting to hear about how you ended up there. Yeah. Um, so I guess um, I started working for the federal government in uh, the last year of my undergrad through the Federal Student Work Exchange Program. Um, that was about 2013. So I started there as a kind of research analyst. We were doing a lot of market research, um, a lot of literature reviews, um, a little bit of talking to people who benefited from our, you know, our grant programs, essentially, and a little bit of measurement and monitoring of the program success. And while I was there, you know, I had some other co-op students or um, federal work exchange students I was working with. Um, so we had, you know, I'm still friends with many of those people today, which has been fantastic. And uh, one of those people, ended up, uh, well, they were studying economics and then they ended up doing um, a master's degree in entrepreneurship and innovation. And then they started working at RBC and they had told me about uh, this job for you know a research position with RBC. And um, yeah, basically just networking and finding people who <laughs> are looking for people doing what you wanna do. So interestingly enough, the, like Tyler's job title at RBC Ventures was ethnographer. So the, yeah, yeah. Cool. so the term, the idea, that sort of type of research is becoming more popular, I guess. Yeah, I think the other thing that's important is that, I, you know, as an anthropologist and as a researcher, I've never been looking for the typical anthropology jobs, if you could point to one at all. <laughs> um, but I've always been interested in kind of research for private industry, for design, for marketing. And so I've actively looked and tried to cultivate skills that are useful in those areas as well. So emphasizing the aspects of my education that fit those roles. You mentioned that you started working when you were an undergrad. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that was an FSWEP program or something that was sort of a, a bridging program. And, and I think that's uh, you know, important for students to hear about that that's a, a possibility when you're, when you're studying. Yeah, definitely. Um, so 
I've we're through all of my degrees. It's just kind of the way that I am. You know, I like to have other projects on the go and I like to, to be, you know, working in other areas and doing other things. So um, naturally I was looking for jobs that paid a little bit better than I think at the time I had been uh, working at a, a video rental store. If people can remember <laughs> what those are. Um, and uh, I was teaching guitar lessons for a while. You know, I did a lot of, I did a lot of jobs, uh, landscaping as well. Um, but uh, obviously wanted something that was a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more air conditioned and a little bit more in line with my career goals. So um, my dad had actually told me about the federal work, ex federal student work exchange program. Just I keep call using it, it up, FSWEP. People call it FSWEP, I'll call it FSWEP. Um, my dad had told me that because he actually works with the federal government as well. Um, and so uh, I think it was one year, 2013, I had applied to a bunch of stuff and uh, yeah, found, um found uh, a job uh with Canadian Heritage they randomly sort of choose you right you sort of like submit your application and then like it's sort of shipped around to right. different departments yeah you basically fill in all your education history your work <clears throat> history your interests you know your areas of you know specialization or yeah. um whatever and your profile or your you know, your uh, records kind of get shopped around to different organizations and different government agencies that are hiring okay. and so you may get like a bunch of different uh job ads or job requests or interview requests I guess mm -hmm. with uh, managers from various departments so I think I had quite a few from a, a lot of different ones like yeah ones that I wasn't even expecting um but yeah, yeah. and this was something that happened after you after you finished your undergrad or did it sort of start while you were still uh so I was hired or? in the summer after my third year Undergrad. You actually have to be a student to be eligible for the FSOP program and have to be going to school the following year. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, and so, yes, because I remember in my, in the fourth year of my undergrad before I was supposed to graduate, um, my continued summer employment there was contingent on the fact that I was still a student. <laughs> <laughs> but then they hired you afterwards kind of thing. They did. Yes. I was bridged in eventually. Um, in your first year of your PhD. Yeah, the first year of my PhD. Yeah, yeah. wow. Ooh. I know. <laughs> I was there for five years and uh, I was able to work. They actually hired me continuously every um, semester for uh, part time work during the school year and then full time work during the summer. Maybe you could talk a little bit about So, your master's is in design anthropology, which I had never heard of until I sort of had heard about the kind of things you're interested in. Um, I think that's one of the things we want to showcase is how broad. Um, the discipline of anthropology is. So, so can you talk just a little bit about the masters and then what you're kind of generally working on now, just to give people a, a sense of the breadth of, of anthropology? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, my, my degree is still technically in anthropology, but what I did was I kind of architected it in a way where I was credited for some coursework that I did in the School of Industrial Design. So it, you kind of have to get creative with it, but um, one of the maybe lesser known facts about just going to university in general is that you can have specific reading courses with uh, specific professors who you can arrange a reading list and assignments that suit your kind of goals. Uh, and you can also do coursework in other departments that you feel like would benefit you and you can get credit for them. So what I did was I just reached out to some of the professors at the Carleton School of Industrial Design. I said, hey, this is what I'm interested in. I know it's a thing that you guys do. Um, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to participate in some of the classes. I'd like to join some of the classes. And so I was able to get into some courses on like, uh, they call design studio work. So it's really just coming up with ideas for products or services or concepts. Um, and going through kind of design thinking activities to try and, and see how you would make them come to life, essentially. Um, so I did a lot of that work. I did some specific custom courses around relating kind of research and anthropology to like market research and marketing research and design research and how, um, you know, qualitative research methods are leveraged in other industries for other purposes, other than kind of going to strange places around the world and uh, watching people. Uh, um, but yeah, so I feel like I'm kind of rambling, but that's basically what I did. I just made sure that I took a lot of cross-listed classes or classes from other departments that fit my uh, kind of intentions with the program and got credit for them and yeah, made it my own. 
you know, your degree is in a life sentence, you know, your course load is in a life sentence, you can do whatever you want with it, you can take whatever courses you want, you can drop whatever courses you want, you can go outside the kind of, you know, suggested or required course load for your degree and make it your own and you can, and doing that sets you apart, I think, in a large way from the people that you're going to be eventually competing with for jobs. Um, but it also kind of provides you with like a different, you know, different perspective on your own, you know, focus and your own studies. So I wouldn't think about anthropology in the same way um, that I do now, given that I've, because I've taken those other courses and I've had those other experiences. So it helps kind of both ways. And I don't think I would have gotten the job at RBC had I not done those cross-listed cross courses in the School of Industrial Design, because part of being able to work in this industry is knowing how to talk the language, knowing how, knowing what the processes are, knowing how to, you know, integrate what you know and what your skills are into a larger organization that has its own kind of cadences and processes. So uh, a big part of it was just being able to, you know, know how my skills fit into that environment and position them that way, you know, in an interview and, you know, then just do the, do the job, right? Why choose Carlton? These videos are in part uh, a way of sharing information with current students, but also with prospective students. Uh, so why would uh, a grade 12 student perhaps choose Carlton Anthropology as opposed to somewhere else that, that they might be considering? So I think there are quite a few reasons, and I think the most important one obviously depends on the student and the student's interests, but Carlton has a number of things going for it. One, like I said, the people. Um, obviously, the people have been a pretty big part of the experience for me, and definitely the reason that I've been here for so long. Um, you know, I have a great relationship with my supervisor. Um, she's just like a, a brilliant and amazing person. So she's coming to our wedding. Sure, we get our wedding. Okay, and, well. Can you can you just give her name in the so we can. We could give a shout out to her. Sure, her name is uh, Danielle Dina Valley Lang. Her and she and I have been at Carlton almost the same amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, she's been fantastic, and obviously the rest of the anthropology faculty are incredible. There are too many names for me to even remember and mention. So um, that group is definitely you know one of the reasons I've stuck around so much. Um, the other reason is obviously like it's obviously very convenient if you want to do anything related to the federal government. So you want to apply anything to public policy, this is where you, this is where you go. You know, I, when I was working at Canadian Heritage, we had graduates from you know, Simon Fraser and University of British Columbia and all those places. And they're like, well, we got to go, we got to go to Ottawa. <laughs> uh, and that's why they were there. Right. So even in co-ops, they're trying to get into Ottawa. So that's, you know, it's, if that's one of your interests, it's definitely a reason. And it's funny, like in anthropology, it's funny where people end up, right? There's a number of anthropology graduates who are at the CRA right now doing like work that is adjacent to anthropology. So the government is huge. And that means that there's a lot of opportunities that are hard to see right from the get-go. And it's definitely easier to see them when you're in the city that they're based. Um, I think the last thing that I would mention is about why Carlton is, uh, why I would choose Carlton um, is that, um, I mean, at, as someone who lived in Ottawa, it's very tempting to want to see university as a way to kind of escape your hometown and go and do something new. Um, but there's definitely something to be said for the convenience of being able to maintain your local connections and your work relationships and get a great quality education at the same time. So it's, I think it just has to do with more with me and my mindset. Um, but I mean, the, the fact that Carleton is a, like, has all those other things going for it, and then also is, you know, near my house, <laughs> uh, is definitely a, a, a big factor. Thanks, Tyler, that was great. No problem. Uh, we're going to move on to, to Emma, but feel free to add anything if things come up while we're talking to Emma. So um, can uh, we just start by maybe telling us a bit about your current PhD work? I know you have other things going on on the side, but what are you working on right now? Okay, yeah. So uh, my current PhD work is uh, actually centered on uh, Ottawa uh, and, uh, and sort of environmental conservation uh, in general. So my questions are around actually like 
the symbols that uh, we use to understand and sort of connect to climate change issues. Uh, and so the symbol or the, the thing that I'm really interested in is trees. <laughs> so um, Ottawa has this really special green belt and this organizing body that, that um, works on it. Uh, and a lot of the, the push and the focus uh, of, of both the, the National Capital Commission, uh, but as well um, a large number of local organizations is tree planting and maintaining tree cover, urban tree canopies. Uh, and though it might not sound very anthropological, <laughs> my contention or my, my thinking around it is about the ways in which people uh, relate to environmental issues, um, the ways in which they connect to environmental issues, and also the way that they imagine the future uh, and the sort of like things that will save us. Uh, and so trees and tree planting uh, has been of late, the last like three years, I would say, become this like really a salient thing in uh, scientific research and, and conservation research about, you know, is tree canopy um, density like good? Will it capture carbon? Um, all these kinds of things that are sort of like in the realm of mitigating climate change. Uh, and so I'm really curious about how that, like basically how trees became this like new powerful symbol of climate change for the future. Uh, and what that means um, at a local level in Ottawa. My current job at the moment is actually working, uh, it's conveniently uh, related. I'm a communications coordinator um, for a, a relatively young uh, not-for-profit called Climate Legacy, which uh, is attempting to connect seniors, so like 65 plus, um, to various different climate actions and movements in, uh, in their areas. So, and I just wanted to ask a bit about side projects, because I know that there's a few other things going on that you've been working on that I think uh, are interesting to hear about as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> I have a lot of those. Um, so I am, just because it's at the top of my mind, uh, I am a, an editor for the uh, Nokoko African Studies Journal uh, at Carleton. Um, so I, so I do that. Currently, I'm working on a, a workshop for prospective uh, submitters uh, to, the, uh, to the journal. Um, what else do I do? Uh, I am a Horizons. member, yeah, I'm a member of an organization called Horizon Ottawa. Um, so I have in the past um, written documents for them. Uh, I wrote a newsletter. I've spoken at uh, committees, uh, city council committees uh, on, on sort of behalf of that work. Um, what else? I'm a writer. A yeah, I, <laughs> I uh, recently published a book of short stories uh, in December uh, 2020. So um, that was, I mean, it's not a current side project, but sort of writing in general is, is a side project. Um, and, oh, and I volunteer at an organization called Shelter Movers uh, about once a month that uh, is a free moving service basically for women uh, or folks who are leaving abusive situations or moving to shelters or moving out of shelters. I think that's the main stuff. <laughs> I captured the most. <laughs> yeah, and I think maybe you're not doing this as much, but you did set up a website to do editing and stuff, right? Oh, right. A bit yeah. About that? <laughs> do a lot of workshops. yeah, so I also have a sort of side business. Uh, it's not as much active anymore currently, but basically I, uh, I offer editing services for um, students um, at all levels, but uh, I ended up focusing mostly on international students. So folks who just like needed some basic like grammatical help. Um, so I helped a couple of uh, masters and PhD students in the social science department. Um, and I and they actually have a contract uh, coming up in a couple of days to help someone um, with their comps. So comprehensive exam. <laughs> so um, in high school, my plan was to go to university for uh, classical singing. Uh, I went to an arts high school and uh, that was my focus for, for probably, well, for, for about four years uh, of intense sort of uh, practice. Um, so when I decided that that was no longer what I wanted to do, um, I very much came to university sort of like with a new set of eyes. <laughs> um, so I, I started in the journalism program um, and then funny enough, uh, in my, when I was picking courses, I had the option to take an intro to African studies course or an intro to anthropology. Um, totally randomly, I picked African studies uh, and I loved the first year, um, like the first semester of my, of my classes. And then I got a double major through that. And then, I, and then I took anthropology courses sort of like as I moved through because some of them are cross-listed, right, with, with African studies. And so that's how I got into African studies, or sorry, anthropology uh, more generally, like that's what pushed me to do the master's. Um, but yeah, my, my double major in my undergrad was African studies and it was like 
largely, <laughs> largely by focusing sort of like only on my interest and curiosity. Um, unlike Tyler, I was like not, I, I have less uh, strategic uh, <laughs> attitude towards some of this stuff, um, but it was like one of the best decisions I, I ever made. It was a lot of fun and uh, it's uh, done. I mean, I love the African studies department. I teach uh, as a contract instructor there now. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to be part of the department for, for this long. Can you talk about some of the memorable experiences at Carleton and, and really, I think, including some of your travel uh, experiences as well? Because it seems to me, as a parent looking on, that those were some of the, some of the highlights. Sure. Um, so I, in terms of like fast specific travel, I uh, got to travel with the African Studies Department in their um, AFRI 3100 course um, to Rwanda uh, for three weeks. Um, it was a class on the media and genocide, so it really nicely paired with my with both my majors. Uh, yeah, it was an incredible experience. I got to meet a lot of awesome people, um, and because uh, there were like I think there were fifteen of us, we got to talk to uh, Rwandan journalists. We traveled a lot in the country. Um, it uh, it was incredibly impactful. I mean, being in a country, I think we were also there for the twentieth anniversary of the genocide. Um, so so being able to understand some of the nuances of, of what's going on contemporarily in Rwanda, I mean, you know, a time 2014, um, was really eye-opening and it was really, um, it was really encouraging and sort of like, just, just, I felt so lucky that I was in a department and at a school where, where that was possible. Um, and uh, we, we got to meet some Rwandan students and, and overall it was just like a, a really, um, yeah, just a really awesome experience. And, and it had, and it taught me more than like, you know, a sort of course, like sitting in a classroom obviously uh, would um, because you're sort of experiencing a new place every day. Um, and then I would say the other sort of more memorable stuff is like, um, so, you know, I, I had a fairly, a, a very standard high school education and being able to take courses uh, with the African studies, um, major on uh, race and ethnicity, um, being able to sort of really broaden my understanding of uh, like experiences um, that like, you know, people's experiences in the world, in universities, um, in, in our country and, and uh, on the continent was, was incredibly eye-opening. And I, and I would never have been able to get that kind of um, breadth and sort of um, deeper knowledge and understanding about people besides myself and about like things beyond music theory if I had gone into classical music. So I, I feel, I mean, there's no question in my mind that it was the right decision because um, every, every one of those classes were valuable in that way um, and in, in lots of others. So I'll, I'll say first that like all the kind of travel experiences that I did, did were like, it's not something that everyone can do. And so like, I'm, I think less so at the time, but especially now, especially when we can't be doing any travel and especially when I'm in a place uh, where I'm like, where I don't have the money to travel. Like it's, it was an amazing privilege. Um, and the thing about exchanges that maybe make it slightly more accessible where when like, you know, traveling abroad for four months normally wouldn't be is that you're not paying European tuition. Um, you're paying the same Carleton tuition. Um, and then you get to go to a different school in all these different places. Uh, I went to the Netherlands uh, in Utrecht um, and uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> like I, I don't think it's possible for me to really adequately describe uh, the experience in, in the short amount of time, but like long story short, I mean, I, I've never had the same kind of experience since and I'm, I'm really grateful that I was able to do it then. Like I, I got to meet incredible people that I'm still friends with now who are still, who are in the Netherlands. I got to meet, you know, people that are, were also exchange students that I'm still really um, still in touch with. Um, I, I got to, so the, the, the course itself was, was around European journalism. And our final project was to go um, spend a week or spend three, up to three weeks in a capital of our choice and talk about something going on in that capital culturally. Um, so I went to Skopje, Macedonia, which, uh, which I never would have had the opportunity to go to or necessarily the desire to go to beforehand, but it was cheap. And I figured like, okay, Macedonia, why not? Um, and so, and so I went and, and it was, I mean, the thing about the exchange that was most, I think that was most, uh, beneficial to me is I was being, I was independent on my own and making my own decisions around that kind of stuff. And it forced me to 
especially with the journalist stuff where you have to interview people, like you really have to put yourself out there uh, to gain the kinds of opportunities and experiences that you want out of that kind of thing. You know, it's, it's super scary if you're, if you've never traveled before, if it's really new to you, um, it can be really overwhelming. But um, friends that I knew who had that experience, like by the end, they were, they were different people. They had grown so much uh, because they sort of, yeah, they explored on their own. They learned about themselves. They met new people. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a big deal for me. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I have gotten a lot of jobs. Like I have gotten interviews for a lot of jobs because I've mentioned some sort of international experience that I've been in, like, and really weird stuff. And I think this sort of speaks to Tyler's sort of like connections, luck, keeping your eyes open, that kind of stuff. Like the first job I got out of undergrad was a contract um, at um, ESCC. Which stands for? Economic and social development, I think, is what it was. It was? I don't think it is anymore, right? Like, I think I it's don't... innovation and in... no. No. That's a different department. <laughs> Okay. So you worked so for the government. <laughs> yeah, I worked for the government in communications. And uh, and a, a friend of mine had like forwarded my CV and stuff. But um, the reason I got the interview was because one of the people who was doing the hiring process had a dog named Kigali. And she was like, oh, you've been to Rwanda. That's so cool. My dog's name is Kigali. Like, I'm not saying this happens all the time. But additionally, I've gotten other jobs because I've mentioned some sort of experience, like learning experience through travel. And that person's really like travel. The people I'm working for right now are all inter international development people. So talking about my experience in, I mean, in places that they would term, well, in places that international development happens, um, I think, you know, was, a, was a, a social in, right? That makes you sort of, oh, you might be a good fit. I don't, I have a lot of things I could say about the job process, like job searching process, don't need to go into it now. But I think what that shows is that it's uh, I, like being able to talk about your personality, but also your experiences that are sort of outside of school can really make a difference. Um, or outside of like traditional, like I took this class, I took that class, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of other things, like, uh, well, the reality is that a lot of the work that I've looked for is in not-for-profits and NGOs and stuff. And, and it's just kind of hard to find work sometimes. Um, but I've gotten some really good volunteering experiences through my education. Um, and I also like, so my, my undergrad specifically, um, having that African studies and, and journalism background, it, it works really well because I'm able to actually understand content that people are interested in. So when you're like, if you're doing comms work, like, I think it always helps if you're like, yeah, and I actually know something about this stuff or actually have a sense of like, in what ways journalism is ethically, you know, complicit in something related to the continent or, or otherwise, like you have a sense of the broader um, picture as opposed to just the like very like useful but very rote sort of technical skills that you learn in the program. So what advice do you wish you had received as an undergrad and what advice do you have for incoming students? Okay, uh, I wish that someone had told me not to take it so seriously. <laughs> uh, I'm a pretty... I could have been there for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, pretty sure um, I said that at least once or twice, but you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably someone who wasn't my mom, you know, uh, yeah. that's how it always goes, right? But mm -hmm. I think I, so I have zero regrets about the sort of like path that I took to go through undergrad. I also took five years to finish my undergrad. Um, but, but I do think like there were some social experiences that I sort of set aside because I wanted my grades to be good. Like at the end of the day, um, I think what you should take away from it is like, the, the things you've, the actual things you've learned, the experiences you've had, as opposed to focusing on the grades you get. Um, and, and I think that that is hard to, to disconnect yourself from, but I mean, I think that, you know, I think I have a very good GPA, but I think people who didn't have as good a GPA as me still got into master's programs, still got into PhD programs because they had experience and, and they could bring that to their applications. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. And those experiences are, are places where you can apply what you're learning, right? There, there are ways to kind of deploy that knowledge and yep. make use of it. Yeah, and making use of it, I think, is so much more valuable than like than getting achieving a grade. Um, and so, advice that I give to incoming students, <laughs> I mean, in in this times, I would say like really don't take it too seriously. Like we don't know what's going to happen in September, but we do know that this last year has been really hard. So if you can. Um, treat this as, as an experience that like you can get that is like for you and that you should try and get what you want out of it. So take, try things, take random classes, you know, um, uh, sign up for things like it's all advice you probably all heard before, <laughs> but, 
but I think, you know, now, especially like, I mean, take that random Arabic first year Arabic class. I did that in my master's. It was dope. And like, I took a history of the Caribbean course and it was amazing. And those are the things that people should be focusing on, especially coming into this to 2021. The Department of African Studies, like they changed yeah. my life. It's not, it's not a stress to say that. Um, I, I still have relationships with those people um, and, and it's a real community. And I think that that was like, I'm realizing more and more now that is so incredibly important, especially like it was really important to me. And I think it is important to people, even if they don't realize how important it is. And it has such an effect on the way that you actually retain the information oh, yeah. that you're learning, you know, like. Yeah, I, I mean, I still remember my first year uh, intro to African studies class because it was taught by um, Pius Adesamni, who's, who's uh, passed, but you know, I, it's, it's stuck with me because of that was the kind of impactful teaching experience that I got. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to the staff. I think Carlson has like an unparalleled oh, yeah. <laughs> level of staff excellence that is very hard to find other places. Um, and again, like you might not think that this is like a big deal, but oh my God, it's yeah. so, it's, it's such a big deal. It's such a big deal. These such are people who are going to help you navigate like these weird questions. Like, can I get a credit for this course? Yeah. Or <laughs> am I going to get my degree because I did this? <laughs> and, and oh my God, they make such a difference. And yeah. I mean, I, being in anthropology and, and African studies, like, I mean, maybe, you know, the, those people, those staff members have, have been incredible. It's pretty exceptional. Yeah. Um, and besides that, I mean, you know, I'm biased again. African studies at Carleton is one of the, is, is a rarity. There's not many other um, universities in Canada that has a, a department like that. Um, and I think that, that the quality of the work that comes out of there the, the fact that it's growing, that we have a new person um, full-time who's coming in in, this, in September, like it's a really exciting place. Everyone there is super passionate and uh, you, you really can't get it anywhere else. <laughs>